but uh, so I want to talk about a model of human skin today. So it's we're not actually looking at true intact human skin, uh, but this is a, a model which approximates skin. There, there are a couple of different, uh, the, this is a commercial product that we get from a corporation called Mattec, and they uh, produce a couple of different types of uh, different flavors of this. So one is what they call a full thickness tissue, which you can see this little support membrane at the bottom, and then it has a large matrix area with fibroblasts, and then sort of an epidermal layer with um, epithelial cells that differentiate up towards the, uh, this keratinized layer which stains uh, pinkish in the picture. And then there's also what I'll be talking about today, this uh, epi-200, which is really just the epidermal layer. So the, this doesn't contain any fibroblasts, but it does contain the, the differentiating cells as they go up from the, there's a basal layer um, that sits right next to the support membrane, and then the cells differentiate up until they finally become completely cornified. And so there's a number of things that you can do with a model like this. And uh, I just, for kind of orientation, and I know at least one person here has actually worked with this model, I think, so um, I don't know that everybody has this. So just for, for a bit of introduction for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, so this is a, con oh, I hate these things because I always push the wrong button. Um, so this is just showing unirradiated skin tissue, and the, in this slice, unfortunately, the membrane should be right here. It's peeled away, but this is the basal layer that you can see, very nice, tightly packed uh, nuclei, well differentiated, um, coming up through the granular layer here, and then very clearly you can see this cornified layer, which is mostly keratin as the cells become terminally differentiated. Uh, after exposure to radiation, now in this case, this slide, this is just broad beam whole tissue irradiation. Um, but so, and three days later, here you can see the support membrane. And again, the basal layer, there's, you're getting a, a few little um, hitches here. But you can see also a lot of nuclei within this granular layer here. Now, and this is uh, after just 0.1 gray, so 10 centigray of dose to the whole tissue. So already fairly low dose, you see pretty systemic effects throughout the tissue. Um, and this disruption of the differentiation program here where the, if you look over on this side, you don't really see these dark purple nuclei in, in this layer, but you're, you're getting a, a compaction of the granular layer and you're getting a lot of nuclei that survive even into where the, the cells are mostly keratin, they're not losing their nuclei. So you get a, a major disruption of the differentiation program. Um, and then at a higher dose, two gray here, you see more of that. You still have these nuclei in the, in the uh, keratinocytes, um, and you see a thickening of the keratin layer, but you also see almost a loss of the basal layer. There's a few nuclei down here, but you're getting kind of massive tissue destruction once you get up to that sort of dose. So that's just sort of to give you a, an orientation of the, the model and kind of generally what it looks like with high and low doses of radiation. Um, and or maybe I should have switched these, I guess. Again, a little orientation to the model. This is how it grows. So over, at, I hate these things. Over in the photograph here, you can see these little inserts, which this is a schematic of, of them. And the tissue grows inside this little plug, which then can float in a, uh, in this case, a six well plate with medium on the outside, such you can see there. And in cross-section, you can tell this is the, so the, the tissue is growing sort of with the membrane just above the medium. So the, the tissue actually grows at the medium air interface, which again allows it to differentiate. If you had it submerged in the medium, you wouldn't get the normal differentiation program. So uh, that's sort of what these things look like. And then we can take these little inserts out temporarily away from the medium, away from the well and uh, irradiate them either in broad field, as you saw in the previous slide, or on the microbeam. And uh, so then what we've done is, uh, in some of the, the subsequent slides that I'll show you, is we've aligned the microbeam and shot along the central axis through the middle of the tissue like this, so that we've created a plane of microbeam irradiated cells. Now, and I think everything I'm showing you here is from protons, which will from go pretty much through the tissue. We've also done some experiments with alpha particles where you've got that added um, factor 
that they're not going to penetrate very far. They will get through that support membrane that I showed you, and they'll go into the basal layer and deposit most of their energy right in that basal layer of cells, but they won't go all the way through the tissue. So that's, again, as I'm sure you've been hearing, it's always something to, um, to keep in mind, especially with these thick samples, some of the, the uh, whole animal models that you've seen earlier, or something like this, depending on the energy and what particle you're using. Sometimes you have to think about what cells it's hitting, how far into the tissue it's actually going. Uh, but for the protons, um, these are pretty much going straight through. Uh, so then what we've been able to do is our machine shop has devised this little um, custom microtome for us. You can see that there's a little micro gauge here which moves the, this assembly uh, a relative to the uh, slicing blade, which is just a, a razor blade, but it allows us to make very thin sections. Um, and so we can align the, the section with the, this plane with the irradiated cells, um, chop the tissue in half, and then section back away from, um, from that plane of irradiated cells. And so uh, using this sort of a setup, this is some work which was done actually a while ago now, um, came out in PNAS in 2005. This was kind of the first proof of principle using these tissues and showing that we really could do a, a microbeam irradiate a plane of cells and then look at an effect at a distance away. And now I forget, have you had any, th I think you've had some lecture on bystander with cells, right? Is that correct? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> too much of a lecture was that? <laughs> uh, so you're familiar with this concept of the irradiated cells talking to other cells nearby in the environment. And so that's essentially what these studies that I'll be showing you are investigating, but now looking in something approximating a three-dimensional tissue construct. So again, it's not intact skin, it's not a whole animal, um, but it is a, a good model using human cells in growing in that sort of lifelike architecture. Um, so you have a three-dimensional construct and we're looking at what signaling goes out from the irradiated cells and how far into the 3D tissue it might go. And uh, so in this experiment, the, uh, the same types of sections were taken from either unexposed control tissue sections or from um, cells that have been, or tissues that have been irradiated down the middle, but then scoring in the unirradiated bystanders. And so this is micronuclei, and I, I think you've seen the micronucleus assay in the, in the cells probably. Uh, but so here we're scoring these uh, small budding little bits that seem to bud off the nucleus. Uh, this assay here is a little bit different from what you probably saw with the cells in that this is an in situ assay. So we're not, in this case, we're not looking at the cytoclasin B accumulation of cells that have divided. So it's a little bit, um, you tend to get less frequent events because you're not pushing the cells to divide and then accumulating events like you do with the cell assay. Um, but nonetheless, we were able to score a significant increase in bystanders. And they, they go out for, in this case, about 500 microns away from the, the plane of the irradiated cells, and then sort of gently start to drop off, go back towards the control levels, which by about 700 microns for this assay, uh, we're seeing it not that different from the control levels, which, you know, they bounce around a bit, but they're fairly, um, fairly consistent. And this, the line through here is the, the mean of the control values across all the, the distances. And, uh, so now this actually is some later work that we did uh, trying to do the binucleate assay. So this is a little bit trickier because you've got to take those sections of the tissue and disassociate them and then stimulate them to divide and do the cytoclase and try to collect the binucleates. Um, so we, it was very difficult to get a good number of cells to score, which is partly why there's fewer distance points here. Uh, but also it's a pretty tricky assay. But again, we saw, uh, this, this point's not terribly convincing, but at least at some, in some of the bystanders here, big variation. But we did see um, at least out to 0.5 millimeter, 500 microns, um, some indication that yes, we were seeing a bystander effect even when we disassociated the cells. But I think the, uh, it seemed like the, the in situ assay for this was a little bit easier to score, and I think it was just some of the technical difficulties in disrupting the tissue, trying to get the cells to grow. Um, you have an extra time delay in there, too. So for this particular model, I think the in situ assay was better and probably more informative. Um, but if we look at these also now, just comparing the data from those two, you know, with the controls bopping around and everything, 
Uh, the control levels were actually quite different using the two techniques. This is just a comparison of um, the two different ways of measuring micronuclei and which were done several years apart. Um, if we normalize them to the controls in the, in the assay model that we're using, you can see that the results now actually look like they're tracking not so badly. They show that same sort of elevation. This point's maybe a little high, but if you remember, the error bars were pretty large on the, on the binucleate assay here. Um, and then they're, they're definitely going down um, back towards the, the baseline level, which in this case would be one because they're normalized to the control. So it's normalizing to the control at each individual point. Um, so again, I think the, the two assays were showing us more or less the same thing, um, but maybe just the insight you one was a little easier to actually perform and get data from. Uh, so we've also looked at, bi at uh, apoptosis in bystander tissue using the same model. And in this case, we got a very nice robust response. I think it's a very clear differentiation between the controls as a function of distance from the middle and uh, the unirradiated bystander tissue as a, a function of distance away from that irradiated plane. And uh, in this case, we really see high levels of, uh, of apoptotic cells in the bystanders out to maybe 800 microns and gradually starts dropping down, but really convincingly and actually statistically different um, levels, I think through the statistical significance, I think maintained through this point, so through one millimeter away from the tissue, and then still maybe a little bit of an uptrend beyond that, but definitely coming back down towards the, uh, the baseline. Um, so this was a very nice assay as far as seeing a signal going out into the tissue and seeing a physiological effect. Um, from the very narrow bit of irradiation now. So this was you know, a single line of particles put through a tissue and at least a millimeter away the cells are hearing a signal which is causing at least some of them to apoptose and this is uh, just a, a staining assay. The, the dark nuclei in this case are, are apoptotic nuclei. Um, so having, having done this, and this was sort of a, a baseline then for the subsequent studies, um, my lab is interested in gene expression. And so uh, one of the things that we did was to actually cut slightly thicker sections but use the same general um, approach where you have that irradiation through the plane in the middle of the tissue and then you look at various distances back further away from it. Um, and we looked at actually whole genome microarray analysis to really try to get a handle on, well, what is responding at least? We, it's hard to track down the, the signaling molecule that's going out. We know it goes very rapidly that's been really hard to, to catch right in action. And I'm, I'm sure you heard some of that in the, uh, in the cell talk. Uh, but we wanted to see, well, what's happening in the tissue in response to that signal going out? And can we sort of infer anything from that? What can we learn? Um, and then we followed this up with uh, measurement of some of the individual genes using uh, real-time PCR. Whoop. And uh, so I'll just give you, oh, did I skip a slide there? No. Oh, OK, right, sorry. I think we did actually look at, uh, at some of the, the individual genes first, but I'm showing this slide first anyway. Um, so this is just comparing two time points that we looked at, so one and 16 hours after the irradiation down the middle. And in this case, we were actually, uh, we did measure the, that first section. So that first central segment that we cut off contains some irradiated cells and some bystanders. So it's a little bit hard to interpret, but um, I guess it got thrown in the mix anyway. So that's this first, uh, the first point on both of these. And then at increasing distances away from the plane of irradiation to this last section, which is centered around a millimeter away from the cells that were irradiated. And if we just look for, the, for a moment at the uh, one hour post irradiation, we see, uh, depending what gene we're looking at, the, the MMP1 in green here doesn't look terribly active at the, at the early time. Um, for the CYP1B1, which is uh, a gene that responds to chemical damage, um, we're seeing first a depression very at the site of irradiation very close to it. We're seeing that, that gene underexpressed, and then it seems to come up more towards the normal levels further away. So either the signal's not reaching further than that or it hasn't got there yet, one or the other. Uh, if we look at the PTGS2, this is a very interesting pattern, I think, and this is a gene which uh, you may remember, I'm sure was talked about in the cell uh, portion of the bystander talk, 
has been of a lot of interest in, uh, in the cellular work that's been done on bystander. Seems to be a major responder and potential uh, link in the in this chain of signal transduction for bystander response. And uh, what we found was the irradiated segment had a real high level of this. Hour after irradiation, we're seeing huge expression here. Um, then coming down a little bit as you get further away. And we get this dip here, and then it seems to be coming up again. So that was a little bit strange. Then when we looked at it uh, at a later time, now if we look at 16 hours, um, we see no change in that central section. So the cells that were irradiated and, and the close bystanders seem to have gone back more or less to their normal baseline level. But then as we go further away, we're getting increases. But I think this is a little more understandable. If you couple this pattern, if you just looked here, you'd say, well, this is weird. How can it like jump over and not affect cells here, but then start affecting cells further away? That's a really weird signal. Um, but when you look at the pattern in one hour, it seems to be um, that maybe we have waves of expression. That, you know, that signal radiates out from the irradiated cells, takes it a little while to, to travel out as far as it's going to get. But meanwhile, you're starting to get a response you know, close in, spreading further out. As time goes by, those first cells that responded maybe are starting to go back to background. But you're still getting that kind of residual wave as it moves out through the tissue. And that's something that uh, we just, we haven't been able to look at things like that with, with um, cell monoculture. Because, you know, you've got cells, it's really, I, I guess we haven't really developed a, a reliable method for making them stay put in the dish and then scraping them from a little, little um, strip on the dish or something. That's, I don't think that really would be feasible. If you've ever watched cells um, on time-lapse photography, they walk around a lot. So uh, this 3D structure allows the cells to be kind of locked in, and we can actually, for the first time, look and see, well, how is this wave propagating in space and in time both? So uh, that in itself was quite interesting. And uh, oh, this is just showing, um, so in the 2D culture, this is now 2D cells, but what I thought was interesting here is the same gene, and we see this is the earliest point here now is a half hour, and so in this case, we can't look in space, but we can take serial samples across time. And what we had found earlier for this gene was in the two-dimensional cell culture. We would get this really early peak at half an hour. We see huge expression. It starts coming down by one hour. By two hours, it's almost back to the background level. And then it starts going up again. So again, this, this is maybe the same type of thing that we're seeing in the tissues, where you get a pulse of signal and it may be followed by a second pulse. And, you know, but then it complicates the pattern as it diffuses out through the, the three-dimensional space, whereas on the dish, you're just mixing all the cells together and you, you miss that fine-tuning. But I think it's at least consistent with this kind of wave pattern of expression that we've seen before in, uh, in the time courses. So uh, then the, the next thing that we did here was uh, to take these central sections here and look at um, the whole gene, whole genome expression. And so in this case, I really didn't want to include that first section that had some irradiated cells and some not, because it's just too hard to tell exactly what you're looking at there. You know, if you could say, oh, this was just all the irradiated cells, but we can't pick those out individually. So um, that, we excluded this, um, this section for the expression arrays. And then we also left off the, uh, the furthest one, because the individual genes we'd looked at, we were seeing a lot more variability there. So I think it, it looks like, and this is around based on the, the apoptosis that we had seen and the micronuclei, the signal seems to be getting, maybe the one millimeter is about seems to be the far end of the reach. Um, and so it seemed like we were getting some genes responding here, some genes not. We felt like this was kind of the solid core of where the, you know, the main bystander um, responses were going to be going on. So that was what we looked at for the uh, gene expression. And uh, so comparing these, these sections with uh, the controls from the same part of the tissue, so the same depth away from the center, uh, we found just over 800 genes that were differentially expressed. And uh, so with a p-value less than 0 0.005 and a false discovery rate less than 5%, if any of you have uh, done these types of analyses. I, so who's done these kind of whole genome things. Anybody? What, two people? Okay. Excellent. So, uh, so at least some of you know some of the jargon there, but um, 
essentially we, we uh, identified about 800 genes here that were differentially expressed. And uh, so one of the first things that you do in this kind of a, a study is you say, well, what kind of genes are these? Do we see any patterns of, that might be linked to physiological functions? Can we get some clue as to you know, what these genes might mean? Why are a certain group of genes being expressed in a certain way? And you know, indeed, is there any sort of coherence? Or are we just getting kind of random genes with random functions that don't really look like they're acting in a physiological way? And uh, so I'm sure you can't probably read these, but this, these are lists of uh, some of the top functions. So when you do these gene ontology analyses, you can take a list of genes, so our bystander genes in this case, and compare them against a number of categories. So say, for instance, cell cycle. It's a big radiation response category. You tend to see a lot of cell cycle genes. Makes sense. We know cell cycle is affected by radiation exposure. Um, but so what you do is then you compare your list of genes and say, I've got 800 genes and, I don't know, 40 of them are cell cycle genes. And I say, well, how many cell cycle genes are there? And so based on a gene list, 800 in length, how many would I expect to be in that category just by chance? If they're randomly distributed, do I see more in my group than I would expect by random chance? Or is it just not that interesting? You know, you've got a couple of genes, but they're not really, you know, enhanced. And so this is the kind of analysis that we do here. And uh, you get a p-value, which suggests um, overexpression or underexpression of specific categories. So that's what these lists are. And the kind of the cutting to the chase in the uh, direct exposure. And so, oh, sorry. So this is comparing now here. This is our bystander gene list. And we're comparing it with direct exposure, which was a, done in a separate experiment. So just irradiating the whole tissue with protons. Sorry, skip that part. So when we expose the whole, the whole tissue, we see predominantly functions that are involved with cell cycle and replication, which sort of makes sense. You, you irradiate things. That's certainly one of the chief things that you expect to happen. Um, in the bystanders, however, we saw um, a little bit of, of um, cell cycle, but not so much. For the most part, we were getting functions related to signal transduction, a lot of NF-kappa-B type linked things. And this is very consistent with what we've seen in the past in bystander cells in, in two-dimensional culture. So we do seem to be seeing some of the findings from the cell lines are now being recapitulated in this higher structure three-dimensional tissue. And so I think that's very encouraging. This is one of the types of questions that we want to ask with this type of model is, you know, well, is any of the cell work that people have been doing really relevant? Does that going to apply when cells are in a three-dimensional structure moving towards being in a whole tissue or a whole animal, as you've seen. And uh, just then to kind of follow up, these days you do gene expression. You kind of have to have one of these crazy diagrams that shows a bunch of stuff all being interacting. Um, but this is, I think, a little bit interesting. So this is a, a node around the NF-kappa B complex showing all of these uh, molecules that are colored in. Uh, red represents upregulated. Uh, green represents downregulated genes. And uh, so all of these gene products are known to be regulated by the NF-kappa B complex. Again, as I said, that's one of the real major hubs that we see responding um, in, the, in the 2D cell lines. So this is really just underlying that NF-kappa B still seems to be a major player in bystander response, whether you're in 2D or in 3D. And uh, interestingly, though, we got this big set of these uh, G protein coupled receptors which is something we hadn't really seen before. So this may be a new layer uh, that's laid on top in this. It may be cell type specific because uh, we haven't really done much work with the, you know, we haven't worked with the exact same cell type um, before. But I think it may also be something that's layered on top of the, the 2D findings once we go into this three dimensions. So we're seeing a little bit different, uh, different sets of players emerge, but that core response still seems to be the same again, uh, centered around NF-kappa B. Um, so that's really all that I uh, have to say here. And so just kind of going through what, what we've seen is that micronuclei are indeed induced in 3D tissues that is bystander to irradiation tissues. And uh, this has been done in, in human tissue. And we see similar results, whether we do the in situ or the, the binucleate assay. 
And uh, we've shown by n numerous means now that a bystander signal can travel at least between 750 and 1,000 microns from the initiating site of the irradiated cells. And uh, again, in three-dimensional tissue. Uh, and then the gene expression that we found in the bystander tissue is consistent with the stress signaling and tissue remodeling functions that we've seen uh, physiologically, some of these remodeling differentiation responses. Um, and that were measured as physiological endpoints. And uh, also the, the signaling seems to be consistent with the signaling that we see in the 2D cells. So um, that was kind of the, the whirlwind tour through the 3D tissues. And uh, oh, right, and of course, thanks to many people who have been involved with this work, uh, largely the team out here at RARAF that makes it all possible. And I think I've probably left uh, some time for questions and discussion. That was the intent at least.